Thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, today we have a lecture by Dr. Robin McKenna, who is going to talk about the ethics and the epistemology of preservation. Uh, this is a part of the lecture series in the Extreme Beliefs Project, which is carried out here at the um, Brown University and is investigating the ethics and the epistemology of fundamentalism. Uh, you're welcome to visit the website of the project, extremebeliefs.com, uh, which contains various resources on different topics related to extreme beliefs and the description of up upcoming events. Um, on that topic, on the 21st of March, there is going to be a lecture by Dr. Peter Naminga, a historian and a religious studies scholar. And then on the 4th and the 5th of April, the research group is organizing a workshop on extremism and subjectivity which will focus on the subjectivity of extremists, conspiracy theorists, fundamentalists, terrorists, and fanatics. Also on the subjectivity of academics who study extremism and related phenomena and uh, of the practitioners who work in their radicalization programs, counter-terrorism measures and resilience efforts. And you are most welcome to join um, both events. Um, as I said, uh, today's lecture will be given by Dr. Robin McKenna. He is a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Liverpool. He is also a senior research associate at the University of Johannesburg and on the steering committee of the Political Epistemology Network. Uh, his work focuses mainly on epistemology, but he is also interested in philosophy of language, philosophy of science, ethics, and political philosophy. And his work increasingly, increasingly draws on political uh, psychology, the, the psychology of persuasion, and also science communication. Uh, he has recently published a book on non-ideal epistemology, and his new projects include a book on skepticism and cognitive biases with J. Adam Carter, a book on the ethics of, and epistemology of persuasion, and papers on various topics in epistemology, ethics, and political uh, philosophy. So please, Dr. McKenna, the floor is yours. Wait, so I was going to stand up, but is that going to, if you tilt this back a bit more, that's not too strange. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, uh, can I stand there and show? Sure. Yeah, yeah, make sure. Okay. I'm in the screen. We don't really see much, that should be okay. We did check, it was 45 minutes roundabout. Yeah, yeah? okay. So, uh, let me try and do that. Okay, so thanks for the invitation. Uh, really happy to be here. Let me start by playing down expectations. I'm afraid that. Um, there's not really anything in here directly about extreme beliefs or fundamentalism. Uh, one thing that we can do in the Q&A is talk about how the, the framework I'm going to be uh, describing might uh, be helpful for thinking about extreme beliefs and fundamentalism. So that's what I'm not going to do. What am I actually going to do? Well, so recently I've been doing some work on what you might call the ethics and epistemology of science and communication. So that's one of the themes of the book that was just mentioned, also quite a few papers I published. So in this work, I'm interested in persuasion in the context of science communication. So you've got uh, science denial and I guess science deniers, people who deny the science on things like climate change. And then there's this question of how you might go about persuading them to, to rethink things, to change their mind. So to me, it seemed like uh, a good thing to do would be to think more generally about persuasion. So think about the psychology of persuasion, how you might go about persuading people, think, think about persuasion itself, what exactly is persuasion, and then think about a range of ethical and epistemological questions. And that's what we're trying to do in this talk. This is very much the beginning of the project, not the end. So uh, I welcome feedback from everyone about um, directions to take, things to uh, drop, uh, things to emphasize, and so on. Okay, so that's the background. Let me now turn to what's on the, the handout. So I'll be following the handout quite closely. So if you lose the track of, uh, of what I'm saying, you just go back to the handout and yeah, pick it up from there. Okay, so the title is Ethics and Epistemology of Persuasion. What do I mean by uh, these things? First of all, the epistemology of persuasion. So not always, but some of the time. Uh, the aim of persuasion is not just to bring about a change of mind, but uh, a rational change of mind. A change of mind based on relevant reasons. The word rational is in there. Epistemologists have lots of views of rationality, so it's natural that epistemologists get involved in, in that. The ethics of persuasion. So, of course, just because you can persuade someone by using some means or other doesn't mean that you should. Um, so, it's interesting ethical questions about the extent to which it is permissible to try and persuade uh, others to change their minds. So, that's the ethics of persuasion. So, as far as there's a thesis here, uh, the thesis is this. Uh, there is sometimes uh, what we call a tension between the ethics and the epistemology of persuasion. That is, 
some persuasive strategies that stand a good chance of bringing about a rational change of mind uh, are at least um, to give us pause from the ethical point of view. Uh, so tension, I'm trying to keep this a bit loose. Uh, the idea is that sometimes we could be pulled in different directions, uh, depending on whether we focus on the epistemic rationality issues or the ethical, sometimes also kind of political issues. Now, sometimes philosophers want to just make existential claims. That's not what I'm doing here. The claim is not just that attention is possible. The claim is that in certain contexts, the persuasive strategies that we have good reason to think are most likely to work, that is be effective in bringing about a rational change of mind. These are the ones that are particularly problematic. Well, I guess others can be problematic, but these ones that like to work are problematic uh, from an ethical and or political point of view. Finally, uh, again, a lot of the time when philosophers say they'll identify attention, the whole point is to resolve the tension, right? You say here's attention, but here's why it goes away, and with all that's meant uh, today from that experience. That's not what I'm going to try and do here. Rather, actually, I want to suggest that this is a situation where it's actually good to recognize the tension and not try to dissolve it, at least not try to dissolve it too quickly. Um, I think actually we can learn something from seeing that we could be pushed in different directions, depending whether we focus on rationality issues or, or ethical slash political issues. Okay, so that's the introduction. Um, so what I'll do now is talk a little bit about what persuasion is, what exactly I mean by persuasion when I'm moving on to section two of the handout. So I mean, there's lots of, the, the, there is quite a lot of work in philosophy on persuasion, if you kind of look around, but what there isn't is a kind of standard off the shelf account in philosophy of what persuasion is. Um, rather, persuasion gets talked about in a big range of different philosophical contexts, not so much as a subject in its own right. On the other hand, there is a lot in argumentation theory and also bits of psychology uh, that is actually about like, the nature of persuasion, so what, what exactly it is to persuade someone. Um, so that's the literature I want to draw on in terms of kind of definitional slash conceptual questions. So on the handout, I've got a quote from Daniel O'Keefe, who is a central figure in both the argumentation theory and the psychology literatures. Uh, this is from a, a, a textbook he wrote on persuasion, and he gives a definition that to me seems as good as any, so it's the one that I'll use. So O'Keefe tells us that persuasion is a, I'm quoting now, successful intentional effort at influencing another's mental state, through communication in a circumstance in which the persuadee, as the person that you're trying to persuade, has some measure of freedom. So as I said, I'll be using this definition, so let me just comment on some of the key aspects of it. First of all, uh, he says persuasion is a successful intentional effort, so that is persuasion is a success term. If you try and persuade someone but fail, that's not persuasion, that's attempt to persuasion. Uh, insofar as one wants to lean on ordinary usage, that seems to fit with ordinary usage. But, but anyway, as it's been defined here, it's a success now. Of course, you can talk about persuasive attempts and, and so on, but persuasion itself is a success now. Second, persuasion is what I'm going to call directional. This is a term I'm taking from a recent book by Alexander Kopok that I'll mention quite a few times in this talk. What he means by this is that when you're trying to persuade someone, you're not just trying to change uh, a relevant mental state, you're trying to push that mental state in a particular direction, right? You want to make someone more pro high taxes on the rich, you, you, try, you try to make that attitude more favorable towards high taxes on the rich. It wouldn't be successful if you made them less pro that, um, that policy. Um, so it's not just change of attitude, it's change of attitude in a particular direction. Third, and perhaps most importantly, um, it's part of this definition that um, with persuasion, it must be that the target of the persuasive message uh, freely changes their mind, or as Oki puts it, has some measure of freedom. Now, this is the bit that's meant to distinguish uh, persuasion from coercion, indoctrination, and manipulation. So the idea with these three kind of bad words is that there might be uh, a change of uh, mind or a change of attitude, uh, but it is in some way not free. So, of course, there's all sorts of complicated questions one can ask here about what exactly they mean by freedom. Um, I'm not going to get into them. Um, I think the claim one want to make is that whoever you want to understand freedom here, there's going to be a difference between, on the one hand, persuasion, on the other hand, things like coercion, and that difference has got something to do with freedom, however you choose to understand freedom. 
Okay, so that's the definition. So there's a distinction that people often want to draw in literature on persuasion. And that's between what I'm going to call rational and non-rational persuasion. So there's a version of this distinction in a recent paper by Amelia Godber and uh, Gloria Origi. So what they say is that rational persuasion, that's persuading by simply offering facts, evidence, and reasons. Non-rational persuasion, that's persuading by appeal to emotions or by making uh, your cultural, personal, political identity salient, something that kind of in some way or other differs from simply offering facts, evidence, and reasons. So I don't think this definition, or this or rather this distinction, uh, as it stands, can really work. Why? Well, very briefly, because it's kind of obvious that you can you can draw someone's attention to relevant facts by appealing to emotions, by making a particular cultural, personal, particular identity salient. So, for example, you show someone a, a horrific video of factory farming practices. There's very little narration, just what's required to be clear that's what's being depicted. The idea is to persuade people that factory farming is, uh, is a terrible practice. Um, but you're doing this by appealing to their emotions, right? But you, 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 what you're trying to do is by invoking a kind of horror, lead them to recognize a uh, kind of moral uh, insight, as it were. So you're trying to get them to recognize the force of relevant reasons, but you're doing it via an appeal to emotions. So that I think shows that this distinction between rational and non-rational persuasion, if you're going to make it, it has to be made in a rather more sophisticated way. So I think there's a, a better way of drawing something like this distinction, although as we might get into the q and I think there's still some problems with it. And that's a distinction I take from uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Vid Simoniti, uh, between modes of persuasion that, as he puts it, use the objective style versus modes of persuasion that in some way or other depart from the objective style. What does he mean by the objective style? Well, I've got some nice illustrative uh, quotes on the handout, bottom of page one, top of page two. So as Simoniti says that the objective style separates the speaker's idiosyncratic position from the content of her arguments, eliminating such features as willful self-contradiction or lack of fierceness. And it, uh, it makes no concession to laziness or to biases or to being easily distracted or indeed to the propensity to be moved by anything other than the force of the better argument. Because it involves perspicuously structuring arguments and impartially laying out evidence, the objective style is, at least in principle, accessible to all. It is easy for reasonable participants to follow. So you might detect the hint of mockery in these uh, in these quotes. That is intentional. So what I think, if I recall correctly, what he's doing is he's taking a kind of self description from Tim Williamson of the method of analytic philosophy and kind of generalizing from that. So this is what Williamson says good philosophy does. Well, that's kind of how proponents of the objective style would describe to themselves what they are doing. There's kind of undercurrent in the paper that there's a kind of element of self deception here, and that undercurrent will go through the rest of this talk. But I think kind of we can recognize that something genuine is being depicted here. Right? This kind of way of arguing that, uh, at least insofar as it is possible, tries to just set out the facts with no spin, all substance, no style, so to speak. Of course, that itself is a style, but you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a certain kind of style. It's subjective style. That's why it's called, I'm calling it objective style. So yeah, I think this, this distinction does work even once you recognize these kinds of points. So, then, of course, there are modes of persuasion that depart from the subjective style. And these are the modes of persuasion that Simoniti is interested in his paper, and I'll also be interested in them in the rest of this talk. What might that be? Well, it might be a mode of persuasion that foregrounds personal experience. Think about how people in politics often argue, I have this personal experience of poverty, and that's why my plan to get to poverty is the right plan you're using your personal experience as part of your argument. Um, and it's not just kind of, you can't get rid of that part of the argument. It's actually doing quite a lot of, it's not just rhetorical work, it's doing genuine argumentative work as well. Uh, so Simoniti is particularly interested in artistic modes of persuasion. There's quite a lot in his paper about satire, ways in which satire can cut through political biases. So his example here is, kind of, I guess by now, slightly dated, but the example is South Park. South Park, at least for a time, could reach quite a diverse political audience because it mostly made fun of everyone, right? So that means that 
you know, everyone can enjoy it because um, it was kind of equal opportunity offence uh, all around. And he thinks that's kind of important because that's kind of a way in which uh, an artistic mode of persuasion can kind of cut through uh, partisan uh, problems in US politics. What I've been interested in in previous work, and this will uh, come back uh, later on in the talk, are modes of persuasion that exploit the audience's biases, as it's put in the quote, um, that exploit our tendency towards certain kinds of laziness uh, or, uh, and so on. I'll give some examples of that in what follows, so I'm not saying anything more about that right now. Okay, so that's persuasion, what it is. Let's move on now to the psychology of persuasion. So first of all, I want to comment on something that at least I thought was interesting, whether you agree, I guess I'll find out. If you ask a philosopher about persuasion, I imagine they'll think you're talking about beliefs and changing beliefs, right? Philosophers are very interested in beliefs. I guess if they're practical philosophers, they're also interested in changing intentions and so on, but we're, I guess, doing some kind of epistemology here, so we'll focus on beliefs. Psychologists, though, they typically talk about attitudes and attitude change. So you'll see books with titles like The Psychology of Attitude Change. This is kind of, in a way, the psychology of persuasion. So what do psychologists mean by attitudes here? Well, they don't mean what philosophers mean by attitudes. They mean something else. So uh, about a quote on the handout, I think it gives a nice definition of what they mean. In attitude psychology, attitudes are viewed as uh, learned predispositions to respond in a consistently favourable or unfavourable manner with respect to a given object. So, you know, I've got an attitude towards chocolate. I like it. Attitude towards um, the rain. I don't mind it. Uh, but I also have attitudes towards things like political parties, uh, policies, um, abstract moral principles. You can have attitudes towards anything, essentially. So these attitudes are not just kind of immediate responses. The idea is that they've got uh, bases. What are these bases? Well, I don't know. As, as is always the case in psychology, everyone seems to say something different. But what we can say is that it involves some combination of uh, beliefs about the object of attitude. So my attitude towards a uh, political party is based on the beliefs I have about them. Also, emotions or feelings towards the attitude object. Uh, perhaps uh, you can't really separate my dislike of this party from my kind of I don't know, instinctual aversion I feel whenever I see a member of the party. Um, also past behavior involving the attitude object. Perhaps I like my car because it's frequently taken me places where I've had pleasant experiences. Like that. So the reason I'm emphasizing these bases is that one kind of good model of how attitude change works, and this is a model you get in the book by Kopak I mentioned earlier, is that you change attitudes by changing the underlying basis, right? So you change the attitude towards uh, political policy by uh, revising the beliefs, for example, I have about this. You, you argue that this policy will, uh, contrary to my initial expectations, actually lead to a reduction in poverty. That might change your attitude towards the policy. If I like reducing poverty, it makes me more uh, enthusiastic about the, the policy. So I've got a bit on the handout about the elaboration likelihood model of persuasion. I'm not going to get into that. And for some reason, it's still there, even though every time I've given this uh, talk, I haven't got into it. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to give me a chance to say this, though, which is that um, in the psychology of persuasion, there is a profusion of different models of persuasion. Right? There's lots of them. Um, the elaboration likelihood model is just one of them. What these models do is they say that, well, look, here are the variables that we should view persuasive strategies as targeting, right? So in the elaboration likelihood model, the variables are first, how motivated, how, sorry, how motivated uh, the target of persuasive message is to think about the thing in question and how likely they are to think about the thing in question. The idea being, if someone is highly motivated and very likely to spend a lot of time thinking about something, you can give them quite a complicated message, right? Someone who's really into politics you can try and persuade them about some political thing by kind of giving them a really long, complicated argument. Someone who doesn't care about politics, but that's not a very effective strategy, right? That's even too obvious. Um, so the point I want to make here is just that uh, whatever your model of persuasion in psychology, that's going to tell you, well, here are the variables that matter. And someone who wants to devise a successful persuasive strategy is going to say, well, here are the variables. Here's how my persuasive strategy uh, is targeting those variables, right? That's just how, how things work. Um, so 
what this tells you is that successful persuasive strategies are always going to be targeted at a particular audience. They won't be all purpose, you know, this will be a strategy for what that, different ones for that are different in some way, and so on. And a crawler of that, of course, is that, you know, you can, you can, have, you can have quite different persuasive strategies uh, for different audiences and in different contexts. Um, okay, that, that wasn't so concrete. Let me, let me get a bit more concrete. Um, so I said that I've done quite a lot of previous work on persuasion in science communication. And I think this is a kind of nice example of what I just said about how you might want uh, kind of different strategies for different audiences. There's a kind of, this is a bit artificial, but it's a lot of nice things to say. There's a kind of divide in the literature on uh, science communication between uh, proponents of, of two very different kinds of persuasive strategies. So on the one hand, you have people who think that the, the right approach to science communication is just to provide lots of information, right? So good, good scientific information. And as much of the kind of arguments or evidence for the scientific claims you're making as you think your audience is able to understand. So I'll call these simple information reporting strategies. So Alexander Kopok mentioned that for the third time, his recent book defends this sort of approach to science communication and also some kinds of political uh, persuasion as well. And in more philosophical vein, Michael Gerken's uh, recent book on science communication is defending a version of, of this kind of approach as well. So that's the one camp. The other camp, represented by, I guess, most prominently uh, Dan Kahan, um, people who's, uh, who have published papers with as well, is what I'll call uh, value-based reporting strategies. So the idea that Kahan and others have is that simple information strategies just don't work in situations where the, the relevant issues have become contested, right? So take climate change, for example. Here, of course, at least in certain countries, they're focusing on the US, so this is very much true. The issue has become very, very partisan. Um, and they think that in that kind of situation, providing information is, uh, is not going to work for familiar reasons to do with confirmation bias and so on. So what Kahan proposes is rather that you, you adopt strategies that are designed to appeal to the values of your intended audience. So you want to reach uh, US conservative uh, climate skeptics. You don't want to lead with how tackling climate change allows us to overthrow capitalism. It's a bad idea. Rather, you appeal to kind of American ideas about like kind of technology and innovation and the idea that kind of you kind of, I don't know, technology is a solution to everything. Also kind of argue that, well, actually, this is a way of, um, I don't know, stimulating the economy. Uh, because the sorts of things people often do, in fact, with uh, climate change communication. So there's this debate between these two, two parties. Um, I don't really want to get into the debate because it kind of seems obvious to me that we should probably try both these kinds of things in, in different contexts. So the idea that there is kind of a right way of going about it uh, to me doesn't seem particularly uh, promising. So um, perhaps you could argue that in certain contexts you should do one thing rather than the other. I don't really see how you would argue that you should always do one thing and never the other. Um, so that seems to be, to be kind of a, almost like a phony debate. Um, but I do want to make the point that this distinction between these two different modes of persuasion nicely uh, um, utilizes the earlier distinction between modes of persuasion that use the object, object, objective style and modes of persuasion that depart from right? So these simple information reporting strategies, that's very much persuasion in the objective style, value-based reporting, that's very much um, a mode of persuasion that departs from the objective style in, in certain respects. And this will become important later. Okay, let me just take a quick pause for a drink. Right, let's move on now to, to section four. So now we're gonna get into the, the promised uh, epistemological and ethical issues, starting with the epistemological issues. So, so why might you think that we need an epistemology of persuasion at all? After all, um, for many purposes, what you're trying to do in persuading someone is just bring about a change of attitude. I mean, sometimes not even that, right? Perhaps all you want them to do is behave in a certain way, right? A political party wants people to vote for them. I don't think they really care that much why. Yes, in the long term, they might care. But in the short term, if you want to win the election, all that matters is that you vote for the party. 
changing their actual underlying attitudes uh, is only important as far as it's a means to that, that end. So that's all true. Um, but I think it's kind of equally true that uh, for other purposes, you might be interested in a uh, change of attitude that is in some sense for the right reasons. Why? Well, if you want the change of attitude to be robust, it seems natural to think that if it's based on good reasons, it will be in a certain sense more robust. In what sense? Well, it'll be a change of attitude that is less likely to be kind of ungone uh, if new evidence comes to the fore. Um, it makes it more psychologically robust as well. Um, there's another additional thing you might say here. Some people think that we can talk about epistemic paternalism, that there's a kind of way in which you'd be interested in the epistemic state of someone's beliefs or someone's attitudes. Um, I'm not myself entirely convinced that that's kind of motivation, but certainly I think there are all sorts of reasons why you might think we'd be interested in not just changes of attitude, but changes of attitude for the right reason. So that is rational uh, changes of attitude. Now, there's a natural assumption that you might make, which I want to argue against. So if you don't think it's that natural, that's fine by me. But the natural assumption is that uh, modes of persuasion that utilize the objective style, so that involves just giving people information and arguments and so on, they are better suited uh, to bringing about rational changes of attitude than modes of persuasion that depart from the objective side. So I say better suited because the claim is not that they are uniquely suited, rather the claim is that they are, as I put it, better suited. You might get rational changes of attitude using other modes of persuasion, but the ones that utilize the objective style, from this point of view anyway, they're the best ones. So why might this be a natural assumption? Well, the idea would be that persuasion in the objective style, well, that involves providing reasons, arguments, uh, evidence, so presumably, uh, changes of attitude in response to the persuasive uh, strategy are going to be based on, on those reasons. On the other hand, uh, modes of persuasion that depart from the objective style, um, well, the ways in which they depart from the objective style may in some way or other mean that the change of attitude is, is less than rational. That's right? so a common idea that if your mind is changed by uh, an emotive message, that's in some sense not as good as your mind being changed by, by a powerful argument. So I don't, I don't actually agree with that, I'll be arguing against it in a second, but that's the thing you might think. Some people might think that. So why shouldn't you think that? Um, well, I want to, to raise two problems, the second of which I'll, I guess, spend more time on than the first, but that's not because it's more important, it's because the first would require me to go into more detail than I have the time to. So the first problem with this natural assumption is that uh, it seems kind of, true to me that uh, modes of persuasion that use the objective style, well, they also can bring about uh, changes of attitude that are less than, than fully rational. So uh, if uh, you give someone an argument and they change their mind after hearing that argument, it might be that what drove their acceptance of the argument isn't that they can have in some sense recognized its rational force, but rather that, for example, the conclusion of the argument fitted quite nicely with what they wanted to believe in the first place, right? And it confirmed their, their biases or their, their prejudices. Um, that's the kind of crude thing that can happen, probably too crude. I think what's more realistic is that in a wide range of situations, you've got some complicated issue, you're aware of arguments for and against a certain view, and your kind of inclinations as to what you want to be true lead you to assess the weight of these arguments in such a way that your view comes out on top. Uh, and that's much less crude than the thing I just said, right? Because it's not that you're entirely subverting rationality to these kind of other considerations. It's that, you know, your inclinations, one way or another, they're kind of influencing your appraisals of the strength of, of arguments. They're not entirely dictating those appraisals, but they're influencing those, those appraisals. So, yeah, the point being that uh, it could be the reasons why someone accepts an argument or takes a, a piece of information um, are not entirely... Um, well, they detract from the rationality of the resulting attitude. That's a kind of more general way of making this point, I think, which is that um, this distinction between information reporting strategies and value-based reporting, that's a distinction at the level of the content of the persuasive message or perhaps the intentions underlying the persuasive strategy. But there's a difference between the content or intent of a persuasive message 
and how that message is processed by the, uh, by the audience, right? So you might give someone um, an argument, um, but that doesn't by itself secure that they will uh, process um, that argument in a particularly rational way. Um, so I think otherwise would be to kind of ignore the distinction between the content of the message and how that message is processed by the audience, which could be very different things. So that's the first problem with this natural assumption. So the second problem is that when you look at examples of modes of persuasion that depart from the objective style, it seems kind of clear that they uh, could very well bring about a change of attitude that is entirely rational. So let me give two examples of this. So the first one, is everyone here familiar with framing? So the idea is that you know, you've got a problem like climate change. Uh, you can frame it in a few different ways, right? You could frame it as a kind of existential risk to the human race, you could frame it as a chance for human innovation, you could frame it in all sorts of different ways. Right? There's just all these ways in which you can frame the problem. You can frame solutions to it in different ways. You, you could frame something as a kind of tax on um, industry or as a, a levy, or you can give word things in different ways. And these are gonna spark up different associations uh, for the, um, the audience of your persuasive message. So what, Dan Kahan says is that um, we should utilize framing effects when designing uh, persuasive strategies in the climate uh, communication context. Uh, so for example, we can frame climate change uh, and climate change mitigation policies in ways designed to conservative or liberal or libertarian or what have you, uh, political values. His idea is that if you do that, what you're doing effectively is trying to circumvent the biases that prevent the, the target of your message from recognizing the force of relevant arguments and evidence. So you're not trying to get them to accept the message by non-rational means, rather you're trying to get around the thing that's stopping them accepting the, the arguments that you are after all presenting in your, in your message. So there's a nice, quote from Kahan that I use all the time, I think nicely makes the point. He says that it would not be a gross simplification, this is a proper page four of the handout, it would not be a gross simplification to say that science needs better marketing. Unlike commercial advertising, however, the goal of these techniques, such as framing, is not to induce public acceptance of any particular conclusion, but rather to create an environment for the public's open-minded, unbiased consideration of the best available scientific information. So that's him. I think saying something a bit stronger than what I said, um, so insofar as it's stronger, I don't necessarily agree, but insofar as he's saying what I said, I, I thoroughly agree with it. So the second example, uh, Neil Levy on, on nudging. Is everyone familiar with nudges? I think they're pretty ubiquitous by now, both in the consciousness and in the world around us. Um, so Levy says something similar about nudging, right? So here he's, into, he's, he's focusing here on the class of nudges that plausibly work by impacting your attitudes, right? Not all nudges do that, but, but some nudges do. Uh, so he's focusing on those kinds of nudges. He's not that clear about that, but presumably that must be what he's doing. Um, so what Levy says is that far from bypassing our reasoning capacities, nudges, or rather these kinds of nudges, provide evidence, and therefore any changes in attitude that they prompt are entirely rational. So that one of the examples he uses is a famous example of a nudge being automatically enrolled in your company's uh, pension scheme. So what Levy says is that uh, automatic enrollment is a kind of evidence that being enrolled in the scheme is a good idea, and that makes it entirely rational to go along, uh, along with it. So again, uh, a quote from Levy, nudges don't simply manipulate us by bypassing our capacities to reason. Instead, they provide us with evidence, which we typically weigh appropriately. Nudges don't tend to provide arguments or evidence that fit our paradigms, but that's because our paradigms are of first order evidence. We neglect higher order evidence, but higher order evidence is genuine evidence. I, I don't get into this distinction between first order and higher order evidence, uh, really. All I want to say is that uh, Levy's idea is that you can view a nudge as kind of like a recommendation. So your company automatically enrolls you in the, the pension scheme, that's then recommending that you be enrolled insofar as you have good reason to believe your company isn't trying to screw you over, that is evidence for you 
that uh, being enrolled is a good idea. Of course, you might think your company is trying to screw you over, in which case it's not evidence. But the whole point is that what would make it rational to someone who thinks that their company has the best interests at heart uh, to go along with the nudge? Well, it would be this kind of reconstruct their reasoning. They've enrolled me, looking out for me, therefore this is a good thing for me to do. Uh, and, and Levy's idea is you can view that as you responding to a certain kind of evidence. It's not, of course, kind of direct evidence that being enrolled is a good thing, rather it's kind of, uh, yeah, as he puts it, hieroglyph. So I think that's right so far as it goes. Uh, I don't see any kind of problem with that. I think that what Levy nicely shows is that there's nothing necessarily irrational, there's nothing kind of less than normally rational in responding to nudges in, in this kind of way. Um, that said, uh, I do think that there are a range of worries you might have about nudging, but they belong under the category the ethics of persuasion. So that's why I'll now move to that category. Okay, so good, plenty of time left for the, the final section. Okay, so now into section five, the, the ethics of persuasion. Let me just start by saying that at least in some areas of epistemology, I think people have got this idea that there's, epistemology and ethics have to go together. Like things can't be good from the epistemic point of view, but bad from the moral point of view. Uh, I don't know how popular this is, um, but I think some people have that idea. And I must admit, I don't really see what motivates that. Like, it seems clear to me that these are two different, perhaps connected, but different normative domains. So the idea that like the epistemology persuasion and ethics persuasion might come apart, to me, doesn't seem particularly uh, pre-theoretically surprising. Uh, so yeah, just, just a set of before I start. Okay, so what kinds of ethical worries do I think are raised by persuasion? Well, I want to draw a kind of rough distinction between two classes of worries. It's a very rough distinction, perhaps we challenge you on it, but hopefully it will serve my purposes. So first of all, let's think about persuasive strategies that are designed to, in some way or other, uh, alter people's life choices, right? And what they do with their life, um, how they live their life, uh, things of that sort. So I think when we're interested in those kinds of persuasive strategies, that's where worries about autonomy come to the fore. Right? And I think this is maybe one reason why, when people talk about nudging and the ethics of nudging, they're very preoccupied with autonomy and the idea that nudges might in some way or other infringe on our autonomy. It's because nudges are meant to stop us eating chocolate and doing the kind of silly things that human beings always do. But you might think we have a right to do silly things because, after all, it's my life. Why can't I eat chocolate all the time? Um, I'm kind of caricaturing it, but hopefully you get the idea. So I think. They, these are the kinds of contexts where worries about autonomy uh, come to the fore. So let me start with uh, worries about autonomy in the context of persuasion, and then after that I'll move on to a, a different set of worries. So as I said, many are worried about autonomy in the context of, of nudging and, and nudging. And I think in some cases with, with, with good reason. It's definitely a debate that's worth having. I don't get into that. Rather, I want to say that, well, if you're worried about autonomy in the context of nudges, you should also be worried about autonomy when it comes to modes of persuasion that utilize the objective style. Not to say that, you know, you should always worry about autonomy uh, in these cases. The point is being that kind of, it seems to me like parallel worries apply in the case of certain modes of persuasion that utilize the objective style. So I'm going to draw here on a, a paper that I like to draw on quite a lot. I think it makes some, some very good points uh, by George uh, Tsai from 2014 where essentially he argues that um, like rational argumentation can infringe on autonomy in a roughly similar way to how nudges can infringe on autonomy. So yeah, persuasive strategies that consist in just giving arguments, evidence, and information, they can do the same kind of thing that, uh, that nudges do. So for this, he imagines an example. You've got a father and a daughter. The daughter is trying to decide whether to go to law school or to graduate school in philosophy. The father very much thinks that uh, the daughter, who I think is called Claire, uh, the father's called Peter, I think, yes. Peter very much thinks that Claire should not go to uh, graduate school in philosophy and should go to law school instead. 
And what he does essentially is bombard her with reasons, arguments, bits of information that, uh, at least from his point of view, make it clear that going to law school is the, the right choice. So I imagine him leaving leaflets on the breakfast table uh, constantly wanting to talk to her about this and kind of running through all the reasons why he thinks that um, going to law school is, is the better option. The important point is that he is, all he's doing is giving her these arguments as well. He's not trying to coerce her or trick her or anything like that. So of this case, uh, what Sai says is this, um, when others offer us reasons, I'm quoting now bottom of page four, when others offer us reasons to persuade us at the wrong time, or in the wrong way, they make it harder for us to be able to engage more purely and directly with the reasons most centrally tied to the choice worthiness of our options. When our deliberations are distorted in this way, this potentially alters the self-determining and self-expressive aspects of our decision. The point is that even the rational pressure of Peter's reason giving might potentially alter the nature of Claire's deliberations in a way that results in a sense of loss for Claire. Insofar as the timing of Peter's attempt at rational persuasion precludes Claire from having the purer, more direct engagement with the reasons most centrally relevant to her living situation, this limits her exercise of epistemic agency. So quite a mouthful, hopefully the idea is clear. What he's saying is that um, the way in which Peter is going about this task of persuading Claire is kind of altering the structure of Claire's deliberations in a way that uh, infringes on her um, autonomy, on her, what you might think of as a right, make up her own mind about what to do with her, her life. Okay, so if you don't like that example, perhaps you'll like my example of the phen phenomenon more, perhaps. So I want you to imagine um, someone who has got a chronic uh, medical condition, the kind of condition that requires kind of various kinds of lifestyle changes and for which there are various sorts of assistive technologies uh, available. And Craig's discussing uh, treatment options for the condition with his doctor. So this doctor is very much a fan of medical interventions. He's very much a fan of assistive technology. He can cite all the stats for how this improves patient outcomes in all sorts of ways, like years of life added, years of quality life added, um, outcomes on various kinds of other health conditions, uh, and so on. He's got all these stats at his fingertips, and he's uh, very much in, uh, invested in trying to persuade his patients to, to use all these medical uh, advances. Um, so what I want to say is that, well, look, think of the situation here from Craig's point of view. Um, it's not that he necessarily disagrees with the arguments that his doctor is giving him. Uh, he recognizes that his doctor is making a good case, uh, as it were. Perhaps he recognizes that in some sense, it would be rational uh, for him to go along with what the, the doctor uh, is telling him. I still think there's a way in which the power dynamic between the doctor and the patient, Craig, it just distorts the kind of the structure of Craig's deliberations in the same way I think that uh, Tsai was trying to, to highlight. Um, in a certain sense, it makes it harder for Craig to um, stick with his own inclination, which is not necessarily to make use of all these, these new technologies. Perhaps he thinks that um, even though this is, is a good idea in principle, uh, he'd rather stick with, with what he knows, uh, so to speak. Um, but the way in which the doctor is exerting this the pressure on Craig um, makes it harder for him to go along with um, his own inclinations. And that, I think, speaks against the doctor being quite such a vocal advocate of, of these assistive technologies. Even though it's not because like there's something irrational about Craig going al along with this, uh, that's not the point. The point is just that um, the, the doctor is kind of, if you like, kind of taking over the decision uh, and making it for Craig rather than allowing Craig to make it uh, himself. Okay, let me just finish though by moving away from worries about autonomy and uh, talking about different sorts of ethical concerns you might have with, with persuasion. So when we go back to the science communication context, um, I just don't think that worries about autonomy are particularly pertinent, right? Maybe there's a sense in which um, you might think any kind of mass communication like disrespects individuality of the intended audience, but that just seems to be inherent to the medium. So I don't think that really raises the sorts of ethical concerns we want to focus on. But I do think there are some interesting ethical concerns here. So let me just finish by, by raising them. Um, so here we're going to look at uh, a nice article by Stephen John, which you've got on your, your handout, uh, the reference for it, where he argues that um, 
certain ethical and political values should be, as he puts it, subservient to the epistemic aims of, of science communication. So this is kind of picture where the, the main focus should be on, on rationality and epistemology, not on ethics. So roughly his view is that the central norm governing science communication is very simple. What science communicators should do is only communicate scientific claims that are well established by the standards of the relevant scientific uh, discipline. And crucially, he thinks that this norm overrides any concern we have about honesty, sincerity, and transparency. So a quote from John on your handout, uh, page five. If a scientist knows that reporting a point estimate without adding further qualifications is likely to lead a policymaker to some conclusion, which is in her excellent interest to believe, such as that climate change will lead to ice sheet collapse, whereas a more honest estimate would not lead to such a belief, the policymaker, uh, because the policymaker will disregard her advice too complex, then the, the scientist is justified in making the first seriously precise estimate. I realize that's kind of sentence that doesn't really make much sense when I read out loud, so I'll say it again. What he's saying is that um, you know, scientists can make their claims sound more precise, more impressive than they really are. If you know that your audience, who is perhaps a politician or a policymaker, will get confused if you try and be too precise, it can make sense for you to kind of make things sound more precise, more certain than they really are, because that will get you your intended result. Uh, that is, the politician will, will go and act uh, accordingly. And John says, that's fine. That is uh, dishonest. It is insincere. Kind of versions of this where, I think of this kind of in context of health communications, versions of this where you're not entirely transparent to the public about the process by which say, a consensus statement uh, was arrived at. Again, John thinks that's fine if the kind of aim or result rather, because it's kind of consequentialist, so whether it's aim or result is unclear. Uh, but if the aim is to improve the epistemic situation of your target audience, then that aim justifies the means essentially. Okay, so that's John's picture. I should say that John puts his proposal forward in the context of climate change communication, where you might think that the kind of the, the need for speed and urgency kind of allows us to disregard certain ethical considerations. Um, but he puts it forward as what looks like a proposal for science communication in general. He doesn't explicitly restrict it to, to climate communication. So what I'm doing here essentially is evaluating it as a more general proposal and saying there could be some problems. What are those problems? Well, the first one is that um, even though I think it's clear why John might think that in the case of uh, climate uh, science communication, uh, the ends justify the means. Um, those reasons wouldn't carry across to kind of any science communication context whatsoever. Right? So what argument could you give to think that it is always the case that the epistemic aims of science communication outweigh uh, ethical concerns you might have? Um, there's not really an argument for that because he focuses on this one particular case that then seems to want to generalize. Uh, and second problem in slightly more detail, and this is the one I'll finish with. Um, so I think it's not clear that John is right when he says that um, the way to advance layperson's interests is just to, to make well-established claims, even if that comes at the expense of honesty, sincerity, transparency, and the like. So I'm thinking here about situations where at least the perception that scientists, scientific communicators, are lacking in these traits, that they're dishonest, that they're insincere, that the processes are not transparent. That itself has become an obstacle to accepting the, the message that the scientists want to put across. So I do think here that the COVID-19 pandemic, at least in, in many countries, including my own, is a nice case in point, right? So who's to say whether people that think that uh, public health officials were dishonest are right. That's not the claim here. The claim is rather that there was a perception on the part of certain sections of the public that public health officials were, were lacking in transparency, that the processes were not transparent, that perhaps they were even being dishonest. And that perception is to became a driving force behind various strands of um, COVID denialism and, and, and so on. Uh, and that to me illustrates the dangers of setting aside these ethical concerns and focusing, focusing entirely on making sure that, um, or 
focusing entirely rather on designing messages that you think will serve the epistemic interests of your of your audience. And just to finish with an ad hominem point, it's a bit strange that, that John doesn't recognize this because his own analysis of science denial nicely explains why honesty, sincerity, and transparency uh, matter. So in his analysis, the reason why uh, science deniers have a kind of skeptical stance on science is not because they reject the scientific method, it's because they don't think that scientists are actually following that method. They don't believe them. They think that um, they are captured by certain interest groups uh, and the like. Um, so that kind of, I think to me, makes it obvious why uh, worries about uh, dishonesty or lack of transparency in science uh, could become a fuel for various kinds of, of science skepticism. So to me, that speaks in favor of, at least in certain contexts, putting a premium on making sure that science communication uh, strategies are as honest, sincere, and transparent as they possibly could be. So actually, I think and it goes against the logic of John's own argument uh, to, to set these concerns to one side. Okay, so I think I'm out of time, so I will end there, and I look forward to your questions.